And we're live. Hello, everybody. Hello, Lisa. Hey, Josh. Hello, everyone. Hope everyone is having a good evening. It's cold again. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is indeed winter again in the Ozarks. It, it takes little breaks. Um, and then it comes back with a vengeance. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Lately, it's been Wednesdays. <laughs> It has a, a cold, dark evening for Dark Ozarks and uh, interesting uh, person that we have to discuss tonight. Yes, I always like it when we, when we have someone from the Dark Ozarks that is not one-dimensional and simplistic. And, <laughs> and, and Quantrell is indeed not one-dimensional or simplistic, no. um, easily still hated by mm -hmm. some. I, I think it is fair and important to put that out there, mm -hmm. and and predominantly uh, hated for his role, his leadership role in the burning, uh, the massacre of Lawrence, Kansas. Yes, and 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 understandably, uh, yeah. So, uh, as far as why people have strong feelings. Yes. So, um, before you begin typing from Kansas, your uh, dismay at uh, two current Missourians uh, discussing Quantrell, including aspects of him as a folk hero, um, we do understand. We do. We do. And, and maybe that's one thing to, to note is that often after the war and historians, they very much focus on that, that event. And so Quantrell is sort of in the public mind almost cast as a Kansas character, but he wasn't. Correct. And that, that I think is, is particularly interesting. Uh, I was also noting in the, in the, the, literature review that Quantrell has been featured many times uh, peripherally or directly in various media, um, yeah. old movies, uh, references, TV shows, apparently an episode of Gunsmoke. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I not, if, I, if I've seen that episode, I don't remember <laughs> it. But. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that, uh, that I haven't, but <clears throat> building him into what I would would generally say is a one-dimensional folk hero or mm -hmm. one-dimensional villain yeah. uh, status. Very much sort of just the plain black hat. Mm -hmm. And although it is cliche, uh, I think it bears saying that the the winner of the war writes the history that's very very true you know and of course that you know of course there's there's uh, quite a bit of uh, discussion and and literature on the fact that in some ways the overall narrative of the war was recast actually by the losers mm -hmm. uh, um, and with the lost cause narrative uh from the 1890s from the daughters of the confederacy um yeah. But I think it's also fair to say that that kind of stops at the Mississippi. And when you get west of the Mississippi, that that doesn't necessarily hold true uh, mm -hmm. nearly as much. Right. And, I would agree. And in the Western theater, it is much more the, the federal, the union narrative that prevails. And. I think you see it in a lot of the, 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 the books and the media that's written, um, almost explaining away things that would counter that one-dimensional view. Yes. And I, I think that it's fair to say, in, in, and we'll, we'll get into Jim Lane soon, um, <laughs> there is an interesting point, counterpoint between those two characters for people who don't know. Uh, Jim Lane was... Uh, a Kansas senator, um, and, and Kansas was just recently admitted 
into the union at this point. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> and, and he was also uh, a general uh, in, the, in the federal army at the same time. I was relieved to find that uh, some references that more than a few people had raised the question of the legitimacy of a sitting senator who was also a general uh, leading leading armies into an opposing state that we were in some very unique territory. We were, but again, I think part of that, I, I think I think a part of all of that happened simply because we are on <laughs> the edge of the frontier. Um, yes. And Washington was, you know, rightfully so very occupied with what was going on on their front <laughs> lawn. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hello, Manassas. Uh, and 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 in that regard, with that that newness of territory and the fact that the Kansas Missouri borderland had been bloody for um, mm, a number of years leading up that to this been five or six years, yeah. That we're you know that I think from uh, from a DC perspective. Uh, that this entire region was a huge liability and they to some degrees to some degree were were scrambling to essentially lock the area down for the union yes um i think there were those that saw the writing on the wall that it could get very complex very bloody very uh entrenched um warfare um that was not going to be more the napoleonic style <laughs> battles that were that was happening uh uh out east so um i think i think people kind of looked the other way as to lane's methods um you know if he could get the job done let's not argue we've got bigger yeah. fish to fry i think was pretty much the the view I I think so. And interestingly enough, that went in, at least until the burning of Osceola, which we discussed last week, that went right. all the way straight to the White House. Yes, yes. Then it was sort of, okay, now what, what's going on here? Yes. Uh, <laughs> <You did what>? <laughs> yeah. And <clears throat> a number of factors. One of the things I was thinking about over the last two days, you know, reviewing the material <clears throat> was... At, at the nucleus of this, we have the actual deeds mm -hmm. of William Clark Quantrell, who mm -hmm. was a very young man. Yes, I mean, when the war started, he was 23. And and that's another thing that, that later writers, and, and particularly from a Northern perspective, you, you get a lot of, um, you get a lot of prologue of, you know, he'd done this and this and this and this. So as you're reading, if you're not adding up the dates, you feel like you're talking about someone older, at least yes. in his thirties, you know? Yeah, and if not, if not old. <laughs> mm -hmm. Very much so. And the thing that I, I kept reviewing because we, we've, we've reviewed mm -hmm. multiple histories of Quantrell. Mm -hmm. And there are points that each of these histories uh, overlap. Uh -huh. And then there are points that the histories diverge. Mm -hmm. And then there are points that the histories contradict one another. Yes, or just completely leave one thing out or, or something else. Yes. And, um, and so it becomes, you, you, you almost have to dissect the views of the author um and and the perspective um you do. and it gets complicated and and i i can see why it it has kind of been transmitted down as very one-dimensional i i can too and i uh, where, where i finally ended up landing on this idea and this is sort of my best way of thinking about it was that we have the actual deeds the, mm -hmm. the the actual life of William Clark Quantrell, and there are many elements of that life we really do not have solid confirmation. That's very true. Uh, I mean, it's very much an enigma. Um, 
you know, um, you know, uh, some people want to discount uh, his own accounts of his early life. Yes. Uh, um, completely. Although there doesn't seem to be a real reason for him to have lied about it in context. Yes. Um, except for the fact that uh, they explain a lot of what who he was and, and why he did what he did ultimately. Yes. And see, you have, you have Quantrell, you have what is told about him in the contemporary and in later years by individuals who saw him uh, as an enemy and right. then also hated him. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you have stories in contemporary and then later told about him by those who saw him as a hero and then as a folk hero uh, right or in, or in, in in those that knew him personally yes and mm -hmm. then you have his as, as you referenced his own accounts um and there was there was some reference and i find this interesting i think we we've got some particular narrative of his story that that really play into this that at the point and this is uh we'll find it on one of these but it's in there uh that that he um essentially the the narrative was accusing Quantrell of embellishing his personal experiences or remaking himself in mm -hmm. order to make himself uh, a more attractive or dashing leader uh, for the Raiders to get behind. Right. And, and that's the, that's the argument. That's, that's the argument. And, but, you know, I'm not really sure that that would have been necessary at the beginning of the war because you, the, the young men that joined him tended to do so very readily, very, um, enthusiastically i mean a compare a more modern um comparison would be you know everyone going down to the draft board you know the day after pearl harbor and enlisting um yeah. and uh, so it, it wasn't as if he were out soliciting uh people to join his his uh, group yes and then at that point it, it really comes down to simply making uh, a call one way or another, 160 years after the fact. Um, mm -hmm. Was he embellishing this and, and adding things, creating his own fiction um, mm -hmm. because that was the type of person that he was or did these things happen? And there, there's, interestingly enough, it's difficult to to prove that some of these things happened, but mm -hmm. it's dang near impossible to prove that they didn't. Exactly, exactly. But one thing that I think it is important to note is that in, in some of these events that we're talking about are basically motivation for him to ultimately um, hate Lane. Um, yeah. But what is fairly clear is that for whatever reason before the war he did join lane yes and and work under him very closely um mm -hmm. and the question is you know did he do that because that was his heartfelt belief in abolition etc at the time and then did a, a 180 or mm -hmm. did he do that out of a sense of revenge <laughs> um, uh, and there there's there's evidence and arguments both ways and that's the interesting thing it is i and and the fact that <clears throat> effective cases could generally be made for both sides of this yes. argument yes um let's uh uh, because and, oh and by the way and and i guess we should say too that uh you know lane's not the only one who switched sides i, I mean come on trail lane switched sides too <laughs> yes he did um in in 
<clears throat> it is it is such a unique point counterpoint. Um, General Jim Lane, Senator Jim Lane, um, <clears throat> fiery abolitionist Kansan Jim Lane, um, <clears throat> troubled and tempestuous order of Lawrence, Kansas <laughs> Jim Lane. Uh, <clears throat> by 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 pretty reasonable standards uh was a a very troubled uh individual yes yes but in, uh, but but initially he he uh, he was pro-slavery yes uh, and I think that is, is, uh, he did, he, he fought in the Mexican American war. Uh -huh. Um, and <clears throat> enough to parlay that into, uh, political power. Yes. In, in Indiana. Um, and by, by all estimates that we can tell, he was a, a phenomenally brilliant individual. Mm -hmm. Highly intelligent. Uh, and uh, zealously intense, um, but there's there's some pretty compelling evidence that he was zealously intent on uh, profiting from. Yes. What he yeah. If he if he if he profited on his rhetoric, then he, he didn't have a problem with that. <clears throat> and this is to me this is this is a really interesting sort of early juncture point in American history in which words, rhetoric, uh, ideal, idealism begins to be combined with mass marketing, uh, mass communication, mm -hmm. and, and in, in, in some ways that, that rhetoric and media are being weaponized uh, very, across the very nation. Much so. Yeah, I, I would say that, and then, um, and, and we said this over on Instagram, we've said it here before too, that, you know, we, we have tend to have very limited degrees of separation of characters in, in, yes. in, uh, Civil War, uh, Missouri and, and Kansas, uh, and time afterwards. And, and he's certainly not the only one to profit from those, um, methods, you know, Jesse James is a prime example who fought under Quandrell. Um, yeah, but Quantrell didn't necessarily. He he really did not utilize those methods, which is no. kind of interesting. It is it is interesting. Um, <clears throat> you know, Quantrell wasn't riding off to Chicago to speak to adoring mobs who you know then proceeded to give him fifteen thousand dollars of uh, you know eighteen sixty one <laughs> currency to go back home to Kansas. Um, and uh, and this, I think, <clears throat> to me, this is this aspect of it is very humanizing, and I find that a positive thing. But mm -hmm. the other side of it is it can be very troubling <clears throat> to uh, individuals who see history in terms of very black and white terms. Right. That um, so as a as a disclaimer before this, I'm going to say that that pro-slavery bushwhacker forces in Missouri did some really horrible things throughout the war mm -hmm. and, and continue to do some really horrible things after the war. Mm -hmm. At the same time, if you start digging into the, the historical record itself, you find individuals in Kansas under the flag of abolition also doing really horrible things. Well, yes, I mean, um this this you know you go back to uh you know lane and john brown and they work together uh it's pretty clear quantrell uh, uh also worked with john brown uh, at that point um mm -hmm. and so yeah. well, he worked for the abolitionist cause at that point whatever whatever the motive may be i mean that gets a little yeah. more uh murky um it does. And so you have all of this going on up until basically, you know, sort of the declaration of war. And that's when 
stances start to change. It, they do, and they really do. And and I think to me this is is also regardless of 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 what side mm -hmm. uh, the the idea with any generation the idea that the end justifies the means when you're committing atrocities rarely holds up well in the longer in the bigger picture on reflection it does not hold up well but <laughs> I mean, that certainly was, was what was going on. And then it was a matter of uh, at what point did the Confederacy or the federal government uh, decide we have a problem now? Yes. <laughs> it, it, yeah. it, and because really, and I think part of it was a function of being in the Western theater. Um, get things done on either yes. side mm -hmm. but when things Which, started going way too far even for the armies involved you know when, when, when you're too violent for the armies you know perhaps things have gone too far yes when the when the confederate chain of command has said yikes we do not want to commission you um when uh <laughs> when the when the union general overseeing the trans mississippi uh, theater says, okay, Lane, you've gone off the rails. You, mm -hmm. you don't get to burn down any more towns indiscriminately just because you want to pack off their goods and services. Yep. Um, this is, this is time to rethink. And <clears throat> so let's, let's dig into, um, the, 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 massacre of Lawrence for a moment, just to set that stage and then work backwards uh lawrence was um uh really the 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 cultural and political and military hub of abolitionist kansas it was it it, it was and um uh, at this point we're talking about august of 1863 so yes. on uh and bushwhackers gorillas uh, and just really a lot of outlaw activity that really was not aligned with either side had been going on for two years, basically, yes. uh, in that context. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I, oh. I, I just wanted to throw in really quickly, you know, this is um, two, uh, two years following the Bernie of Osceola. Mm -hmm. And... Yeah. We've gotten, to me, I think it, it really speaks of the, in these two years of war, how much attitudes of those on the quote unquote front lines had changed. I, I think so. I mean, and, and for anyone that, if, you know, if, if you want to go back and see the video from last week, we talk about Osceola in depth and, mm -hmm. and um, Humboldt. Um, yeah. which was Humboldt led to Osceola and mm -hmm. Lane was involved um, and uh, to give you an idea of where all that was but I think at by the two years later um, I, I think it's a, a process of one attrition and just desensitization yes uh, you have and particularly for the bushwhackers, you have a lot of very young men that have been sort of set loose. And basically, when, when you look at that, you um, some of the lieutenants were very, you know, fast and loose. And actually, mm -hmm. in the scheme of things, Quantrell kept a lid on his men more than most. Yes, which is which is an interesting aspect of that. It is. And, you know, he uh, was more calculating and, and a, a calmer demeanor and uh, tended to look at targets logically. Is it worth the risk or not? Instead of being just indiscriminately, let's, you know, raise hell. <laughs> yes. 
and <clears throat> something that I think bears saying there's a oh to me anyway a a, a pathos to Quantrell's character uh, mm -hmm. to the the life that he lived that really does belie his age I, I think so I mean and again I mean you you when you start really looking into this it's as if you're looking at someone that is older than his years um, yes uh, and it, it does and part of of something that seemed and i i don't know who was responsible for this but there are few um images of Montreal. yeah very uh, few but of the few only one of them appears to actually be untouched and and reflective of what he actually looked like and mm -hmm. I, I found this for myself anyway, I found this a, uh, uh, a unique commentary on American media that in the years following the war, that his image was in no, essence, no. <laughs> yeah, was, was, uh, was airbrushed, they weren't airbrushed, yeah. but in essence airbrushed to make him appear older, to make him uh, appear more fearsome, uh, to give to give him uh, um, black flowing hair and a gigantic handlebar mustache and change the shape of his face. Uh, ostensibly, I I could conjecture to uh, you know sell copies as, or sell uh, you know articles about the. Uh, the terrifying, uh, uh, you know, outlaw, oh, yeah. of, and 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 then you actually find the the one remaining existent picture, and and you're looking at this man going, you you almost look like a kid. He looks like a kid. He he looks very reflective, more sad than anything. Yes. Uh, he looks like someone who has seen too much. Um, yeah. Yes. And most assuredly had. Mm -hmm. And, but does not look like a villain. No, it does not. And <clears throat> something that really jumped out to me in, in regards to that, and it's a tin type, mm -hmm. um, was the notation that George Todd, who was one of his his closest confidant. And, and uh and <clears throat> lieutenants that george todd and william Quantrell traveled in may of 1862 so this is um the war has been going on for a year right and they traveled to hannibal missouri to have their photos taken yes <laughs> and you know to sit in a fancy tin type studio mm -hmm. and and have these we call them photos you know uh these images made uh, and <clears throat> i think something that's very easy to do in now so many so many years removed over 150 years removed is for example, to to imagine uh, America during the Civil War that that everyday life completely stopped, right? And, and no, and, it didn't. You yeah, know, no. And the idea that that during this entire time, um, you know, folks were getting married, kids were being born, folks were were going to the store in this case they were traveling across the state to get their photos taken mm -hmm. um and and but then just the the surreal juxtaposition that not but just a couple of years later Quantrill is not far from hannibal in centralia yeah uh <laughs> leading a massacre of union troops mm -hmm and well and, and of course 
Bloody Bill Anderson, you know, is is the one that typically gets the credit for actually running them down. But yes, <laughs> and but it was also the beginning. You know, part of the beginning of the end. I mean, it was the process of that end that started with Lawrence that uh, a fracturing um, that. Um, Ironically, ones like Anderson felt like they didn't go far enough um, yeah. and, and wanted to be more violent and Quantrell resisted that. And so they started splitting people in the group that decided let's go with Bill Anderson yeah. and, and uh, become even more violent and yes. others who stayed with Quantrell. Yes. And I, I, I appreciated um, the, the Texas State Historical Association has, of course, some really good information uh, about Quantrell. Mo a lot of it particularly and uh, directly, you know, detailing his exploits in Texas and primarily why he fled Texas and was on its way to Kentucky. Yeah. Um, I mean, he was arrested at one point in Texas. So. Yes. Uh, uh, five foot, 10 inches tall. 150 pounds with fair hair, blue eyes, and a florid complexion. <laughs> <laughs> does not not, ex not exactly the devil they make him out to be. <laughs> does not sound like a Hollywood villain. No. And something yeah. that that does seem, and we talked a little bit about this last week, but does seem very consistent with Quantrell is his intelligence in terms of strategy through much of the campaigns yes um that certainly uh belying his youth and, and lack of experience uh at the time um, yes. and um you know planned out and he always seemed to be thinking two steps ahead of what does this mean for on down the line if we do this or that, where you didn't get that with a lot of the guerrilla leaders. Uh, yes. And that's very true. And and ultimately uh, led to some of the fracturing when some of them I think got such a taste taste of uh, of the thrill that they pursued one to pursue that over objectives and i think over that's the, part of where it fell apart i i think that i think that is very fair um and dealing with <clears throat> dealing with the the massacre at lawrence uh a number of factors seem to have gone into the targeting of lawrence it being that the abolitionist hub um, mm -hmm. military, political, and cultural uh, center of, <clears throat> of abolitionist Kansas. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> Lane was there. It, it mm -hmm. seems pretty apparent that they, they timed the attack in an attempt to capture and kill Lane. Mm -hmm. um, and then also, and it's, it's really kind of horrible to contemplate, but during this entire process, uh, across back and forth across the border from Kansas to Missouri is one side burns down somebody's town then the retaliation is to go burn down the other side's town yeah and and uh, Lawrence is is also seen as uh, the largest retribution for the burning of Osceola mm -hmm. yes and, I mean two years in, two years coming basically and, and I think the, you know, I, I don't know, I am only speculating at this point, <clears throat> but the, the idea that Quantrell's raiders, uh, 450 plus men, uh, ranging deep into federal Kansas territory, uh, saw their, their chances as essentially young men who weren't necessarily thinking all of this through yeah. uh, that they they had their enemy right where they wanted and we're going to make them pay for every 
loss and every slight and every atrocity that had occurred up to that point. Right. Uh, and in the case of, of Bloody Bill Anderson, um, his vendetta was very personal. He was um, uh, <clears throat> mourning the death of a sister and the permanent crippling of another sister and the collapse of, uh, of structure, a, a women's jail in mm-hmm. Kansas City. Yes. And, and I, I guess as a, a little bit of a side, that's an interesting thing is that there, um, we tend to think of the Civil War as a man's story, particularly as, as uh, combatants. But in Western Missouri, um, women were very active as guerrilla fighters, um, not, not just as spies or couriers, but as combatants as well, particularly um, Vernon County in the Nevada area, Bates County in the Butler area, Cass County, Harrisonville, and up into Jadson County. And so you actually, they, there became a need of what do we do with these women that we're capturing, you know? And so some were housed um, in Kansas City and after that collapse, uh, then um, my recollection is most of them were moved to Jeff City to the penitentiary. Okay. And whether true or not, there was a rumor going around that uh, Union forces knew about the instability of the building and didn't do anything. Right. And... I mean, and for one thing, who know? I mean, it's it's hard to know. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, also just a matter of you're in a, you're you are in a war zone trying to house people, um, right. and unfortunately, at that point, um, building safety is not necessarily the the top thing on people's minds. No, and I think I think the one thing that we can say with a with a reasonable amount of certainty is that bloody bill anderson believed those rumors yes i i don't think there's any doubt that he he believed it was almost intentional almost as if they had destroyed the building um not just that they overlooked the fact there was danger but like you know Mm -hmm. i think for bill it it would have in his mind they pretty much just you know blew the building up um and so you know, retribution was, was going to be his. <laughs> and, and all of this comes into Lawrence. Yes. Uh, at this moment, uh, the town is sieged and then the 450 strong raiders come into town, mm-hmm. um, bring capture and bring, <clears throat> depending on the re- report, 150 to 183 men and uh, of, of age, ranging in ages from as young as 14 to as old as 90, and mm-hmm. then publicly execute all of them. Yes. Yes. Where, you know, in, in Osceola, it was fairly bloodless. I mean, it wasn't bloodless, but it was fairly bloodless. Uh, not not to this level, anywhere no. near this level. No. And, and I think too, um, you know, we tend to, Lawrence tends to be, you know, the name's Quantrell and, and Bloody Bill to an extent be associated with it. But you had, you had um, several people that were there participating that became quite prominent um, in the narrative of the area later including the james brothers and the younger brothers yes and um they they timed the attack in an attempt to capture and kill senator jim lane yes uh, they missed him because <laughs> the, the the general accounts is that he fled into a yeah. cornfield in his nightgown yes and uh, and eluded capture he he got lucky basically yes and uh, was apparently, you know, the, the pretty strong indicator that he was one of the few who did. Yeah. I mean, 
sort of that, um, uh, you know, kind of almost a fluke of wh why Wayne in particular got away. It's hard to know because it, it didn't see there. I, I haven't read anything that would really tell me that there was a, a particular reason that he was able to elude them. No, it, it know, seemed not a plan or, you know, anything like that. But. No, it just happened to happen. And this was really the, just as uh, the burning of Osceola was, appeared to be the, 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 the turning point in terms of sentiment mm -hmm. um, regarding, uh, regarding General Lane, Senator Lane, um, the burning of Lawrence and the, and, and the massacre of Lawrence uh, seems to be the turning point when a considerable amount of sentiment, including Confederate Army sentiment, turned from Quantrell. Yeah, uh, basically, you, you, you've gone too far, uh, uh, sort of giving the cause a, a, a bad name. Uh, yeah. And um, uh, focusing again, once again, on methods being, you know, important not just the end result um whereas the, yeah. at the very beginning of the war both sides were like if you get good results you know we're, <laughs> we're kind of giving you a pass but um right but as i think as the war wore on and it became more organized in a lot of ways that's when you know they said okay we we, we can't just let anything happen you know because it gets too out of hand yes and 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 it does seem to be um, reasonably clear. Um, Quantrell and several of his immediate compatriots um, did early on join the Confederate Army and fought at the Battle of Wilson's Creek and the Battle of Lexington. And mm -hmm. it, it seems, I think, I think we can we can pretty reasonably say that it's it's factual that yeah. Quantrell chafed under the uh structural requirements of the confederate army uh the and and wanted to do to go further than the confederate army was willing to do even at that time i think so and and perhaps out of in i think perhaps maybe a little bit out of the view that um uh, if if bureaucracy didn't get in the way they might actually get this you know uh win the theater um and yes. that bureaucracy was what was uh keeping them from winning and ultimately i think he may he might have even kind of seen the writing on the wall that if, if they kept going down that path there was no way they were going to win yes and and i think that that is i think that's fair you can see a uh ambitious young man on the ground with a lot of fire saying mm -hmm. essentially why why are we leaving the chips on the table why are why are we doing it this way this is we could do it that way why why are we not and 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 to be honest he he kind of he probably got that view from none other than jim lane when he <laughs> served under him yes and I that remember. is that so we've got um several you know in terms of, of opposing viewpoints one that i i found particularly interesting is actually the the kansapedia kansas historical society um and tells the story of quantrell from a unabashedly kansas perspective uh-huh <laughs> um he went from school teacher to horse thief to slave trader <laughs> <laughs> Uh, he murdered and looted to benefit his own pocketbook. He employed ruthless and unmerciful tactics and planned the Lawrence attack. <clears throat> uh, the massacre at Lawrence has the distinction of being the worst perpetrated during the Civil War. Hmm. And that's their quote, not mine. Yeah. Oh, uh, okay. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that, that 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 could be quite a long uh, discussion in itself. <laughs> I it it did raise a few flags for me. Um, 
Not to mention Let, we're not, we're not going to talk about Sherman in there either. So. <laughs> no. Where? <laughs> what town? <laughs> there's 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 no Sherman, Lisa. There's no Sherman. There's no Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Georgia never heard of her. Um, That's right. <laughs> Apparently not in Kansas. <laughs> <laughs> this is very true. Uh, uh, led his men into Texas, <clears throat> pardon me, to prey upon unprotected wagon trains headed west. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> then I thought this was interesting. Traveled to Kentucky with the plans to surrender to Union forces in Kentucky, disguised as a Confederate officer, and therefore receive federal pardon. Except for the fact that he was wearing federal uniform in Kentucky, so but, but that's that's neither here nor there, right? And <laughs> I, I, as a as a conclusion, even in death, Quantrill's influence continued to plague Kansas. I, I I saw that and I, I find that I'm I'm not, I, I find that a, a bit of a stretch. Um, <laughs> other than the oh. fact that maybe they just regretted not being able to kill him in Kansas. In Kansas, I I'm I'm beginning to get the feeling that um of, of the many campaigns. That, that Quantrill waged some successfully, some unsuccessfully. Uh, perhaps his most successful campaign was his ability to live rent-free in a number of individuals' heads for several generations following. I think so. <laughs> I, I, I do think so. Um, of, of course, uh, Jim Lane probably fits that as well a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the interesting thing and to me is in the of course it memory of Quantrell has faded some mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I'd say in the past since probably the mid mid century mm -hmm. mid 20th century um but Quantrell for for gener a couple of generations really held a, a an incredible spot in people's living rent free in their heads uh an incredible spot in 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 the culture as a whole is sort of this iconic dangerous bushwhacker outlaw well you know i'm it, exactly and you know i think the most famous um biography you know in the title of it they he's named as the devil you know um the devil rides and uh, uh you know that's it's a very wide paintbrush yes and and at the same time that jim lane who documentably committed a number of atrocities and mm -hmm. and did some really interesting and horrible things mm -hmm. uh, is is scarcely remembered that's it, it and it is very interesting and, and and when you think about it his actions were over a longer period of time because it started several years before the war so he yes. was at it for a much longer period of time of course, ostensibly he was on the side of the win the winning side. Mm -hmm. uh, and, he knew the president. <laughs> huh? He knew the president. He knew the president. Um and and I do find it's it's interesting that um when people in Washington started being concerned about Lane and bringing these concerns to Lincoln. He he was at first hesitant to believe it, um, yeah. and and that's and I I think this I think this says something about Lane's brilliance as as uh, a communicator and orator etc. Because you know Lincoln was known for his political savvy and figuring out you know 
uh, people. And the fact yes. that he was initially fooled by Lane, I think, says a lot for Lane's brilliance in that regard. Yes, I, I tend to agree. I really do. And <clears throat> something that I, I'd be very interested, I'm, I'm still wrapping my head around this in, in regards to Jim Lane, is that his, his oratory skills seem to almost enchant an audience. It, it, descriptions are like that. And I think he got. He, I think he got a lot of mileage out of that, particularly in, you know before the war and in the first say year, year and a half. Mm -hmm. The, you know? the idea that if he could get a stage, he mm -hmm. could sway an audience. Exactly, exactly. And you know, um, you know, that's happened other times in history and other places, and and that can be uh, rather frightening. Uh, yes that um if he'd had a bigger stage east it might have been even more frightening to be honest it is it is quite possible and <clears throat> now <clears throat> two sources uh one that i think is probably based on the semi-accepted narrative um and also by kansapedia uh, would be our most controversial yeah is uh, a book by john p birch um entitled charles w quantrell uh, a true history of his guerrilla warfare on the missouri and kansas border during the civil war of 1861 to 1865 you have it uh back in the days when when books had incredibly long titles right here. <laughs> yes yes <laughs> you do uh incredible source and so I'm gonna, uh, speaking of the devil writing, I'm gonna I'm gonna be the devil's advocate here. Okay. And and say you know the 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 critics of Quantrell, who said that, let's see, hang on, uh, you know he was um, murdered and looted to benefit his own pocketbook, was ruthless and unmerciful in his tactics, and went from school teacher to horse thief to slave trader. Okay. <laughs> Uh, end of story. We close the book. Uh, <clears throat> I haven't really ever seen any evidence that he profited in anything. <laughs> that and that, I think, <laughs> is a, is a very, I, I think, a key point. Um, whereas Lane did, I will, I will. Lane did, yeah. I mean, he certainly he made a lot of money in the process of all of this, um, and. Uh, to be quite frank, lined his pockets, but Quantrell, not so much. Now, you know, I, I guess to be fair, uh, there were occasions during the war that some of his men did rob banks yes. in Kansas, particularly yes. the James boys. <laughs> <laughs> Seems to be a pattern. <laughs> But there doesn't seem to be any evidence that Quantrell profited from that directly. I, I, I don't even, I don't even know how. I don't know that there's any clear evidence how much he was aware of that. Um, of that, of that process, and and I think something that that perhaps it's splitting hairs, but I think that it it bears contextualizing in the discussion mm -hmm. is. There is something very different in following a raid, resupplying your men. Yeah. Um, as opposed to before you burn down the town, picking out your favorite grand piano to send back home to your wife. <laughs> that's that's true. And 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 gee, who did that? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that was that was lame. <laughs> <laughs> it it was indeed, and uh, and the fact that, and and okay, so, <clears throat> and for for individuals that might think that there's there's too loose of a connection between Osceola and Lawrence, <clears throat> one of Jim Lane's chaplains, mm -hmm. um, tore out the pews of an Osceola church mm -hmm. before the church was burned. 
and had those pews sent back home to be installed in an abolitionist church in Lawrence. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Lay made it very personal in Osceola. I mean, he really did. Yeah. And, um, and then continued to, and it might have even stopped, to be honest, since he, he was so focused on the money, he, it might have stopped if he'd gotten the money. The, you know, there was over $150,000 in the bank, but they got wind he was coming and they, and they took the money and hit it yes. uh, side of town other places. And so basically they, they uh, blew the safe open and it was empty. And then basically he went into a rage and yes. that's when they started looting pews and pianos and burning things and so on and so forth. Yes. And <clears throat> <clears throat> So coming back, coming back to the book that you have, mm -hmm. um, it, it does bear, also bear telling that the name Quantrell has multiple spellings. It does. It does. And, and, and as was often the case at the time, the same person, you know, it was not uncommon for someone to spell their name differently um, mm -hmm. or people that they knew to spell it differently. Yes. <clears throat> and so uh, the John P. Birch book uses one of the uh, one of the spellings, which is Quantrell with an E at the end. Quantrell as opposed to Quantrill with an I. Um, <clears throat> and he now there what I think is it's, it's a little all over the place. Um, he, he says that that Quantrell was born in Hagerstown, Maryland, and he was, was not. Right. Uh, he was born in um, Dover, Pennsylvania, I believe. I, I think it was, yeah. Uh, I guess all... one, one, I, one, and a preface to this that kind of makes a little bit of sense is the book, um, which is basically um, a personal account by Harrison Trowell, was actually yeah. written about 40 years after the war. So, yes. uh, so some of the details probably are from the fact that he is remembering what Quantrell told him 40 years earlier. Yes. And, and I, and I take that back, um, uh, Dover, Ohio. I had that wrong. Oh, okay. Um, Dover, Ohio. So there Ohio. are some, you know, it, it is at the, at the onset, it is potentially damning because some of the key, um, you know, facts, right don't don't appear to line up with the historical record um they got his date his birthday wrong uh they got his his place of, of birth wrong <clears throat> although his mother was from maryland mm -hmm. and i believe was from hagerstown maryland and so if you are translating this through the the memories of an elderly man 40 years after the fact there there is that and, yeah. it, it, and and who's being relayed this information by Quantrell in the middle of a war. So he's probably not thinking about remembering where <laughs> where was he born versus his mother and that kind of thing either. <laughs> yes. Yeah, very and that's and I think that is is a is a key element with mm -hmm. this. Um uh it does appear that we have record that uh early on uh Quantrell claimed that he was from Maryland in 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 terms of him <clears throat> bolstering his position with the confederate army right and that and that would make sense in that position in that sense you know um if, if you were going to fudge to fudge that way and he yes. probably heard, he'd probably heard enough family stories that he could get enough details right to fool someone maybe yes and i mean for the record nobody knows whether i'm from illinois or iowa um <laughs> <laughs> no one knows if I'm from Kansas or Missouri, you know, where was I born, you know, so there you go. <laughs> and I, in the case anybody wonders, I was born and raised in, in Illinois, mm -hmm. uh, but all my family is from Iowa. Yeah. And uh, so folks, folks assume that I'm from Iowa since my family is from there. And, <clears throat> um, but that, that aside, we have a really interesting story in this book 
that doesn't seem to be elsewhere, but it seems to clearly have made its way into Quantrell's telling, and it it speaks into, mm -hmm. it appears to speak into Quantrell's motives. Right, right. And and it is it is haunting, really. And it's your book, so I'll let you take it from there. <laughs> well, um, <clears throat> long and short, he had, come, he had come west, ended up in Kansas. We won't go through all the machinations, but, um, and his story was that he was with a brother um, and that they had decided to go out, I think, to California. Uh, and this is about 1857, I believe as related there and um they got that they had gone as far as the cottonwood river and were camping and basically were ambushed by some of lane's men mm -hmm. uh, his brother's killed he shot and wounded badly uh they they loot their stuff and uh take their slave uh, yes. and um that uh Basically, he laid there uh, for three days trying to protect his brother's body. And um, an old Shawnee Indian came by um, and rescued him, basically, in that he spent somewhere between six months and a year recuperating with the Indians, then um, taught, taught school for them to basically repay them, <laughs> and then went to Lawrence and join uh lane's um men under an assumed name yes and, and that over the course of the next couple of years um killed the men who had killed his brother yes in in very highly calculating and extremely intelligent ways yes and one thing you know because it's easy to say oh you know this is a complete fabrication, which, and ironically, some of the other sources um, have said, yes, control, control uh, would tell this story, but it didn't happen. Um, yes. But um, what I find interesting is that it's, it's, it's fairly detailed. Um, um, and details are usually more credible and usually have some truth to them if it were yes. a very vague they very vague recollection i'd say well maybe yes maybe no um uh and that upon basically getting back at all the men who killed his brother he revealed himself to lane and announced that he was <laughs> he was switching sides <laughs> that <clears throat> now whether true or not i think that this i think it's fair to say that this story became part of quantrell's missouri yeah yes. is it, it 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 really informs his folk hero status it, it really does that there was a reason for it because we do know that he did i mean he did join lane's men and then he did change sides uh yes. this you, you know that story gives that context of why he did it um ostensibly would be to that he you know uh never had you know political uh, uh alignment with uh, lane and so that he was always basically a Missouri boy um, mm -hmm. and um, was out for revenge. Yes. And that one is, is of course, harder to, to pick apart. That's mm -hmm. part of why it, what makes it so interesting. Mm -hmm. And something that, that the, there was a couple of crossover points. Um, Quantrill, William Clark by uh, Matthew E. Stanley, an article um, from Civil War on the Western Border. Uh, Matthew Stanley uh, is a historian with Albany State University. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Went over uh, a number of points 
<clears throat> one of one of them is that now referencing um referencing the birch book that you have mm -hmm. <clears throat> says what i think is considered to be the sort of the official question mark stamp on the narrative right uh, saying late 1861 Quantrill motivated his men uh, and constructed his own mythology telling them that he and his older brother who probably never existed had been ambushed by Jay Huckers on their way west right that um but the 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 same article uh written by Stanley from Al Albany State University mentions a couple of things that are interesting crossovers um and and in, in, in essence is confirming a couple of things that I find interesting. One, that as a gambler, his alias was Charles or Charlie Hart. Which yes, that is the is, name that he said he used with Lang. Yes, yeah. um, that in a January 1860 letter to his mother in Ohio, he mm -hmm. expressed contempt for John Brown and his sympathizers. This mm -hmm. would have been a year prior to joining the abolitionists and right. fighting for them um and he called john brown a murderer and a robber mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then uh and i and i find this particularly interesting is that the follow-up story in the the birch book mm -hmm. uh which is that there were <clears throat> uh five uh remaining uh, red legs mm -hmm. uh, that uh, the Quantrill had not managed to pick off undercover. Right. <clears throat> that he talked into accompanying him uh, on a raid ostensibly to free slaves in Jackson County at the right. farm of Morgan Walker. Right. <clears throat> and in an ambush that Quantrell arranged with with Morgan Walker yeah that all five of the of the Kansas men who had ostensibly killed had had allegedly killed his brother were killed in that raid exactly or, or in that ambush and so we have um from Civil War on the Western Border uh Matthew E. Stanley from Al Albany State University a confirmation of <clears throat> the ambush at mm -hmm. Morgan Walker farm right and the morgan walker ambush is detailed uh, extensively in mm -hmm. the birch book immediately following uh tales of him infiltrate of quantrell infiltrating the uh, the abolitionist army in essence yes yeah i mean it's it, there, there there is i mean it, once you get past that that superficial um oh no he's he's just you know a guy in a black hat narrative um it, it's hard to just completely say his, his origin story so to speak is wrong you know that he made it up it's it, you can't there's nothing that really points to oh that can't be or that you know because even though even the ones who paint him very darkly, negatively, will say we don't really know much about his early life, yes. um, and they really don't know a lot of those details. So it's hard for them to say. Yes. So I Maybe. yeah I do find that very, I do find that very interesting and sort of an aside that um um for those who'd say oh well trowel made it up uh or whatever you know you can't rely on his narrative ironically the same side the federal side relied on harrison trowel to identify jesse james body interesting that he was indeed dead <clears throat> wow so, so he was the he was the official identifier of the body um mm -hmm. sent by uh governor crittenden um 
and Crittenden asked him to identify Jesse's body because he had rode with him. He knew under Quantrill, knew him, and had established a very successful life after the war of uh, farming in Jackson County. And they they trusted his opinion. So he and actually several other former Quantrell Raiders went to St. Joe and identified the body. Yes. And that is, I think, a really crucial key to this puzzle. I think so, because it's like, well, you trust him enough for that, but you don't trust him for the rest of the story. So, and certainly by the time that he, that it was, that he relayed the story to Birch, you know, there was no ax to grind. There was not, you know, he wasn't, uh, in fact, he had resisted telling his story up to that point. So he, he wasn't out to profit or anything like that. Which really, um, really adds to uh, an important factor in, in interestingly enough, um, so very different that, you know, many, many times following the death of one of these sort of out beyond the pale folk heroes mm -hmm. that there even well into the 20th century that uh their deaths would be heavily exploited mm -hmm. <clears throat> and uh in and sometimes in really uh macabre ways yes <laughs> yes <laughs> putting them on display and charging money and so forth i was uh we're, we're both thinking of billy cook <laughs> yeah <laughs> Through <laughs> to the 1950s, so yes, which you know I, I think is <clears throat> the 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 grotesquerie of that is something that we you know we're 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 existing we're existing in a in a in sort of a contextual framework that that shuns away from the idea of circus animals being asked to perform, and not that long ago. Uh, your <laughs> your regional bandit could be embalmed and put on display and charged a nickel to go visit. Exactly. This is yeah. very <laughs> <laughs> yeah deeply deeply macabre. Now I think probably <clears throat> uh, we've we've done this entire episode. We've not talked about ghosts. Um, but I, I think just maybe a first for us. Um, deeply, however, very dark, um, very dark subject matter that we're dealing with as a whole. Uh, I, I think that it is we. It wouldn't be fair to conclude this episode without talking about William Clark Quantrell's end in Kentucky. Very fair. Very fair. Um just quickly you know after lawrence they came back through and sort of then the as it started to unravel uh some of his men including um uh shepherd and anderson decided they wanted to attack fort blair at badster springs uh which was a, a wooden stockade style uh, fort um and Quantrell was like, no, there's no point to it, you know, and they didn't listen to him and went ahead and massacred the fort. Um, and then they proceeded south into Texas, had trouble. Quantrell was arrested, escaped, and then they sort of started splitting off and he ended up going to uh, Kentucky uh with um about 45 men um and um an interesting thing in, um, in some of the materials that we uh, uh reviewed we talked about uh not only uh the photographer in Hannibal but one in Lexington Missouri that 
became yeah. sort of almost obligatory for the bushwhackers to have their photo taken at. And um, uh, Clark Hawkinsmith was one that uh, photo was taken there. And ultimately the photo was found in uh, uh, California, but uh, also a very young man, younger than Quantrell. Um, he was one of the men with him and um, they're in Kentucky in Spencer County and they basically get ambushed near a schoolhouse um, by Ed Terrell and um, who was a, a self-avowed Confederate guerrilla hunter. He was, he, you know, I mean, you start really getting that the cob, you know, not only am I, you know, looking for them, I'm hunting them down. Uh, and at the time he was only 20, but he had previously been a Confederate and changed sides. Mm -hmm. and, notice a theme. Huh? I said, notice a theme, everybody. Yes, there, notice yes, a theme. Is a theme. And um, so they get ambushed, well, they get, they, they get ambushed near there. They then, you know, retreat. They, they're at um, a farm, I think the Wakefield farm, if I remember right. Mm -hmm. And uh, Terrell tracks their tracks back there. And um, some of his men, a few do get away. Uh, Quantrell at this point, it seems like luck is just not on his side. His horse gets skittish. Uh, he's having trouble mounting the horse. And he gets shot twice. Once yes. through the collarbone that goes down his spine that paralyzes him from the neck down. Um, and then a shot in the left hand that shoots off one of his fingers. Um, Hawkinsmith, realizing that seeing that what's happened he he actually rides back he had started to ride out he and another fella and he gets a hold of Quantrell and is, is in the process of pulling Quantrell onto his horse when he's shot and killed yes. and so they uh, they care for Quantrell at the farmhouse for a few days then they take him to the military prison at Louisville where yes. he lingers for about a month and he's paralyzed from the neck down um, and then dies of his wounds. And I, I find that there's quite a cemetery, symmetry there between his origin story he tells that if this happened and he laid there for days with his dead brother, and then after this in Kentucky, he lays there for a month paralyzed as he dies. It's it's quite a, you know, full circle there. It is. It's haunting. Mm -hmm. And and it's difficult. Very difficult. And and I would the you know, many, many elements of this research I, I found um emotionally haunting. Mm -hmm. Uh and and I think it asked you to to post it. Um, but a photo of Hawkins Smith. Um mm -hmm. Well, it's actually is posted a uh, post I put up early yes. this morning. You know, I had a picture yeah. of okay. Montreal and Hawk and Smith next to each other. You know, his best friend. And mm -hmm. you look at both of them and you look at Hawk and Smith. <clears throat> he's a baby. Over, he's a baby. He's he's an overweight 20 year old. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, who turned around and tried to save his friend. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and died for it. Mm -hmm. And died for it. And. <clears throat> there's you know that that doesn't negate the deaths of 183 men and boys in Lawrence no uh who each have their own moment of tragedy and pathos mm -hmm. and <clears throat> it's and to me it is it is in, in so many ways the civil war was the great cautionary tale very much, very much so, and and I think um, it, 
in Missouri, in Kansas, it it affected everyone so personally, um, and and it did it did in other parts of the country in the, in the Eastern Theater as well. But there were, I think, a lot of times that people went about their business, you know, where in Missouri, you, you did get that, as you said, but there was an overarching um, atmosphere of you don't know who to trust exactly. or still trust Mr. Jones next door uh, because you had such changing winds, uh, you yes. know. It's like these yeah. characters show that uh, I think it was a more pervasive feeling. I think yeah. it was. I think it was, and <clears throat> I'm I'm personally glad that we can we can spend time breaking elements of this down, discussing it, opening it up to public public uh, comment, uh, because so much of this has been overlooked by essentially the, the more Napoleonic elements of the war mm -hmm. um, east of the Mississippi. Mm -hmm. and, and, and these kind of things are just, if they're known, they're known very much just in passing. Yes, yes, or very regionally. Very regionally. <clears throat> or in Kansas. <laughs> Hey, at least Missouri and Kansas don't play football anymore. I guess that's very fair. <laughs> it's probably a good thing. <laughs> oh, oh my gosh! Of course, um, this is a this is concluding aside. But do we know where the the stockade of Baxter Springs was? Mm -hmm. Okay, it's 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 not there now. It's an open open park. Um, but I've been there. It, it, it has a very sort of haunting feeling to it. I mean, it, it's very somber. Yes, very interesting. And, uh, you know, we're uh, prepping for a, a variety of investigations coming up, which yes. we're excited about, prepping for uh, some, some filming and some behind the scenes stuff. And of course, uh, invite everyone to join us on March 12th in Miami, Oklahoma at the Coleman Theater. Yes, a full day of uh, noir history and legends, uh, as well as some paranormal uh, things as well. Uh, go to the page, the events there with information linked to the tickets. You can go to the Coleman Theater website as well for tickets. And uh, it's going to be a great day and beautiful building and it's haunted and you get to tour the tour the building. So. Absolutely, it's going to be amazing. So, it hope is. everybody can make it. Uh, this is a fun night. It really was. Enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> Mayhem is always a fun topic, I guess. Yeah. After the fact, a um, couple of generations removed, it's it's a fantastic topic. Less enjoyable when you're in the middle of it. Very much so. Fair, fair point fair point <laughs> oh so uh we'll be back uh next wednesday with yep. uh, a brand new topic we'll figure what that out and uh we hope everybody's having a great evening yes have a great week and if you have particular questions let us know and otherwise we'll see you next week absolutely thank you all so much lisa thank you thanks josh thank you everyone for tuning in